Oh. Yeah. Oh. It's like Beavis and Butthead. Remember that? Yeah. Oh. yeah, he used to always do that. <laughs> oh. I loved. I used to watch those guys constantly. The, yeah. Those OG cartoons, like uh, Ren, and the best. Ren and Stimpy. Ren and Stimpy was great too. That's hard. Ren. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but no, you're foolish. You're, you're foolish. <laughs> you're foolish. <laughs> That's so great. Yeah. I can't believe we just Stimpy. did that. <laughs> yeah, Stimpy. Yeah, there you go. And his eyes would be popping out. He'd yeah, be like shaking. All blood shot and stuff you know like, what is going on speaking of bloodshot <laughs> <laughs> this is even better here no, oh, no we're gonna um i think it's important that uh as it's a business podcast uh-huh. and if you own a business yep. uh if you work especially a lot of people that listen to our podcast are, are with it with they may not own the business but they're managers that they're who no matter who you are mm-hmm. you're in a leadership position Oh, cool. Whether it's with your family, That's whether true. it's with your children, whatever with, it may be. With yourself. With Yes. Not trying Ooh. to get meta. There we go. Yeah. It just happened. <laughs> Alexander Zuckerberg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. But I mean, w- when you think about great leaders, you can go through time. And, you know, that's one of the problems that I'm seeing right now. You may differ with me on this, but a lot of people did a lot of bad things. In history, a lot of bad things. I mean, we can look at Christopher Columbus. You know, we have Columbus Day, <laughs> which uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, Native Americans would be like, eh, 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 which we see the atrocities of of what Spain did. We see the atrocities of, of what, yes, Queen of, of what, England. Yeah, I mean, we oh, were just talking about that Queen before. Queen of England. <laughs> we uh, English yeah. <laughs> did quite a bit. Yes. Um, and and then you look at even you know our founding forefathers and yep. and this is something that uh, I I like to look at when I look back into history is yes we're more evolved now I think in some areas we are in some areas we're not but I think us definitely I think ten thousand years from now the humans or humanoids whatever they are, are going to be yeah. on this planet they're going to look at us and have the same distaste. They're going to be like, ooh, you guys eat the animals? Ooh, no, you guys ooh. chop trees down? Those oh, are living beings. You don't print your meat out? Yeah. <laughs> you were burning your ionosphere? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They, they eat fossil fuels, really? Stampy. <laughs> They're killing themselves. <laughs> so, you know, whenever we look back and we look at history, yes, it, it, it affords us an opportunity to take like a snapshot of time mm-hmm. and, and to look at in, in those moments of a situation Review. That can be uh, horrific at times, whether we're, we're going to talk about war now yeah, um, and leadership in war, because that's probably the most horrific situation humans can put themselves in. But yeah, I mean, if you're um, going up against another person you do not know, and someone tells you they're the enemy and you have to shoot them mm-hmm. and remove the idea from yourself that that's not another human being with a life and a family and all that other stuff. Right. That's a really interesting aspect. Right? Yes, it is. You yeah. train your perspective not to recognize the actual human value on the other side. You know, I watched this. Um, yeah, they call them targets. And everything yeah, they call them tar- yeah. anything to call them anything but not human being. Yes. You know, target acquired, yes. target destroyed, <laughs> human acquired, human destroyed. Yes. I watched this uh, old video. They did an interview of a gentleman from World War One in the trenches, German guy. And he said, you know, I don't want to get too gruesome on here, but he said, you know, the moment I jumped over into the trenches where the enemy was and I put the bayonet through the guy's chest, it changed for me at that moment because they had all told me, it's like, this is the enemy, this is the enemy. But when you're right in front of someone and you're looking oh, them in the eye like that? Yeah. and you're, you're hitting them with a pig sticker, yeah, it's he's. It was a. It was really. It's, interesting a, it's a lot different change. than shooting somebody from a distance and just watching a body fall. Yeah, that's detachment. Yeah, to be up close and personal like that and hear the pain and hear the suffering mm-hmm. and and to watch their life go out of their body. Yeah, yeah that's. Like, I know it, it sounds strange, but war has become less horrific. It's become, frankly, more pervasive. Yeah, the weapons we've distanced ourselves from the yeah, weapons. We've we've distanced ourselves from essentially the original elements of it. People would probably do less war if it was still, you know, yeah. blades and swords and javelins. Well, I mean, here in New Mexico, we have people that sit in simulators and mm-hmm. take drones to Afghanistan. All, all day right. long. Yeah. All day long. And I here recently, they just actually hit a school. Yep. So, I mean, you know, um, and I, I'm not picking a side either way. I'm just saying these are the casualties of war that you have. But I want to talk about a, a great leader in World War II whether you agree or disagree, and this is 
this is the part that pisses me off is this cancel culture. Mm-hmm. Why why do we have to cancel somebody? Why can't we say here's the bad and good of this person and let's learn from it? He exists. Let's not erase them. Yeah, he existed. Let, let's keep them there. Mm-hmm. It's the same as you're ra- people are erasing people now, just a small group of percentage. I think most of us yeah. agree that we need to have that. It would be the same as saying I don't like the Holocaust and those camps, so let's tear them all down and build a shopping mall. Uh, yeah, I don't you, think you that's wanna, a great The idea. only way that you're going to feel the moments is when you walk into those showers yeah. and you see the shower heads and you realize that you you're standing. The, it's the most gruesome thing ever. Yeah. You're standing in there and you knew thousands of bodies were run through there and they thought they were getting showered. Cleaned. Yes. And, you're and standing and there naked gas. amongst your kin, your kinfolk. They'd pack them in like sardines. Yeah, oh, get off the train. Go yeah. in here. Yeah. We're going to take your luggage. You thought you needed it. Yeah, and we're going to shower you off because of lice and everything else. And nope. No, but the thing is, you, if you get rid of those things, how are the people going forward supposed to learn from it? Yes. Uh, we need to learn, yes. right? Humans make a lot of bad choices throughout history. Leaders make bad choices. Yes. And it's funny, you can lead people to do bad things or lead them to do great things. Mm-hmm. But we need, to, we need to look at that and understand what was going on. It's like, should I erase my past? If I don't like it, should I, should I cancel who I am, my whole history? Just remove it from my perspective and then say I can live about my life going forward? No, you would never do something like that. Well, it's so funny. I was talking to somebody the day and they're like, well, we need to cancel all these, you know, people that were racist and all this stuff, you know, which majority of people were less evolved back then. So mm-hmm. majority of people were racist, majority. And I would not say that all of us have racism in us. No. So, I mean, all of us do to a certain extent. Did you live back then? I know. Yeah. No, you didn't. You weren't in that, that life, but, that culture, that development. At that but time. here's the part that gets me. This same person turned around and said they believe in reincarnation. Yeah. So I'm like, well, let's just erase your past lives. <laughs> then, yeah, let's get rid of those too, you know? I mean, which I personally believe in that. But, I mean, it's like, it's so funny to me how we're so quick to make judgments. Mm-hmm. You know, and as a leader, this is something that's really important. And when you make when you make when you transition from, you know, being a regular person, you're just responsible for yourself, and then you transition to somebody that we're going to talk about now, who you're responsible for tens of thousands of troops. Yeah, it make people shine, or they tremendously fuck up. Yeah, and so, you can see that the more responsibility you get. And before we get into this character, I mean, just leadership in general, things that that I've learned, I constantly, constantly remind myself that. Nobody works underneath me. Mm. Nobody. Yes. They work with me. Yeah. So just because I may be leading and some individuals may look to me for that decision making, for that sense of security, I still have to, I still know that there's a human being there mm-hmm. that's got to put food on the table. Yes. And they're looking to me to make the right decisions to help secure their future. Yes. And they've come here to work with me. They take a risk to be there with you. Yeah, every leader is selfless, and the people that the followers or those people that are underneath you. If you want, I know you're not using I, the I word understand. underneath, yeah, yeah. But they're more if you as being a leader. I've been a leader for a long time. You know, whether from the military, you yep. know, years decades ago to being in positions I've been in, you know, where I've led several hundred people. But it's like I, I always view them as like babies, like selfish little babies. Like a baby's <laughs> ultimately selfish. Well, yeah, the baby's a baby's just totally dependent on you, the they're tr- and and they're gonna cry when they don't when they, and they're going to. And I'm not using this in a negative way. I'm using it in a good way. Like it, there's an innocence there. Correct. You know, as a leader, I should be more evolved than they are. I should I should try to know as much as possible. Right. Learn from their perspective. Yes. And understand that there is a dependence mm-hmm. on me for my leadership. Yes. To make strategic decisions that are have some sort of positive outcome for their future. Yeah, and I, and I, and and whenever I look at them as like a baby, then it's like, okay, they're gonna whine when they, you know, they need to be fed. They're mm-hmm. gonna be, you know, they're gonna feel hungry. And I'm using these metaphorically. I understand. So you can have the pay, like you you don't scream and yell at a baby. No, you're very selfless and loving. You have to listen and nurture and caring. And those are the things that you know, as a leader, even though you get super pissed off. Yeah, you know, because people can irritate the fuck out of you. Yeah. I mean, you're a CEO; yeah. you get that. That's your job all day long. It's people hitting you from all different kinds of angles with problems Just or whatever walled. it is. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's this idea of understanding, and and I think this will go right into. And we're going to talk about General George Patton, which we'll get into him as a character in a second. Yeah, he's interesting. but he said this is one of his quotes: "Wars may be fought with weapons, but they are won by men. It is the spirit of men who follow." 
<clears throat> and of the man who leads that gains the victory. That's just what we were talking about. Yeah, so this is <clears throat> this is a fantastic quote. And he shares a lot of the same fundamentals that Alexander the Great had talked about when he was fighting Darius to become king of Persia at the time. The idea was that even though Darius, this Persian king, and this, I'm tying this directly into Patton, <clears throat> even Darius, this Persian king, who had a massive army, right, 40,000, cavalry, pikemen, everything, you name it, um, many of them were built from mercenaries, right? But Darius gave them the best weapons, everything possibly under the sun, anything they could need because Persia was so wealthy. It was the wealthiest place in the world at the time. On the other side, Alexander the Great said, listen, we are not only outmanned, but we don't even have the, the materials, the tools to win this. Mm. But what we do have is the men who can make it happen. And I'm saying this is the context of the time. They had a thing called, and this is a German term, called Herrenvolker. A Herrenvolker is essentially this idea of this, like, this pure group, genetically pure group. It goes way, way back, far before Hitler. Like the death, the uh, death cults and stuff like yeah, that. Like yeah, like stuff like that. So there are these people that were made to do this. But the uplifting was that it wasn't the focus on saying, oh, you have the best tools to go take care of Darius, right? Which Darius would sell to his army. Oh, we got more people, we got more tools. No, that's not what it was. It was like we had people that we empowered. We spoke to them. Mm. Not to the aspect of the war, not to anything else. We spoke to the individual itself. We spoke to the fact of their Macedonian history, right? If you charge people, if you empower them, if you give them a narrative mm -hmm. to work with, they will do anything under the sun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, we can all we all have watched the movie with William Wallace. Yeah, I mean, and think see, about I it. Mean, the, the, I mean, just one guy running through on a horse, yelling and screaming, <laughs> changed the whole Sometimes that's what it war. takes. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes slap a little paint on you <laughs> and just make people walk tall. Yeah, yeah. You exactly. know what I mean? Yes, exactly, 100%. And when that sort of empowerment and leadership, that can change tides. That changes probabilities. Yeah, and, and uh, General Patton said this, and there's a lot of underlying statements with this quote, and, and I love we can, this. We can, and, un, we can unpack it. Yeah, we can unpack it. He said, prepare for the unknown by studying how others in the past have coped with the unforeseeable and the unpredictable. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he was a student of studying mm -hmm. the past. I mean, he, he even talked about it openly with the spirituality and stuff, and he believed in reincarnation. At and, a time when it was very unpopular oh. to say anything other than what the church was saying. <laughs> oh, yeah. Think about this. But 1940s. His point is, don't cancel the past. Mm -hmm. Look at these mistakes. Mm -hmm. Look at the things that had actually occurred and look at the times when individuals were outnumbered, outmanned, outgunned. The probability was not on their side. Right. How, where was it in the nuance of those great stories that allowed the underdog to take the victory? Yes. And how is it that even when you're a leader and the odds are against you and right. you know it, that when you go and you speak to the people that you are leading... How do you make them say, those odds don't matter to us. We're going to do it anyway. Yes, and, and this was so great because General Patton, which top 10 military moves of all time, was Battle of the Bulge, and mm -hmm. he, he got that victory. And he, was, he, was, he did so good with instilling in the hearts of his men, you know, those colonels and majors and lieutenants and sergeants Correct. and sergeant majors that below him, that they, in turn, would do anything for him. And he knew that. He knew he could leverage those hearts of those men. So when Dwight Eisenhower, which was Patton's boss, yeah. um, came, General Eisenhower, came to him, he's like, this is impossible. You can't do this. Yeah, we can. And Patton was like, oh, yeah, not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but people don't realize. I mean, he was pretty bold. He had uh, pearl-handled uh, six-shooter Western pistols. Right. He's got his cigars walking Ray around. Ray-Ban. Massive coat with a huge fur collar yeah you yeah, know what i mean yeah people should look up general Patton pictures oh man tough as nails yeah and so you know he he finally uh <laughs> whenever whenever they're going to do a, a this counterattack, um he's like well this is going to take you know weeks to prepare it and all this stuff he goes my troops are always ready i have them ready mm -hmm. he goes we can counterattack in 72 hours they're like it's impossible no it's possible <laughs> yeah he's like there's there's an interesting aspect about him Right. And I don't want this to be missed. Before you go as a leader and try to empower those individuals yes. win their hearts and minds of the ones that are looking to you for guidance, right? you have to know as a leader so deeply in yourself who you are. Mm, yes. You have to have so much fucking assurance about your decision making. Mm -hmm. 
that it is absolutely the right thing to do. Because if there is one iota, one crack in your personality, amongst the great body of people that work with you, they will recognize it. (laughs) Yes. They will see it. And then trust will be lost just like that. But not only, you know, because this was a huge risk. This is huge risk. This is a major battle. So not only, not only did he have the confidence in himself as a leader because he, and there's, there's a lot of study on this, but he, you have to think to know that he could pull something off that was impossible mm-hmm. to, to know how much trust he had in his subordinates. Oh, he has to, <laughs> he has to know that when he says something, yes, the level of respect and trust from the individuals that take command from him right. will do exactly what is said. Because if there is any break in communication, yes. whether it's a company today or you're on the battlefront, right. it will fail. Whatever the task is, whatever the objective, yes. whatever the widget is you make, yes. if the communication fails, that line of communication, nothing works. Well, I mean, just the trust he would have to have in his chain of command. Well, imagine. I mean, he's a general, so I mean, this. there's he's got divisions the, underneath him and everything else. The, consider this for a second. I want to put this into context. Wonder how many people he was leading. That right. would be interesting. And we'll th- have to look this up. Yeah. So it, it's I, I don't know if it's tens of thousands or uh, how many troops did General Patton lead? Command. Yeah. Command. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't say surprised because with this he ended up uh, surprising the Germans big time. And then, you know, but it's got to be, you know, I mean, he, he was a general of a whole, I mean, the, well, how, how many troops were in the Battle of the Bulge? Uh, okay. B-U-L-G-E. We can just see with this one battle. Yeah, Battle of the Bulge troops. He was in charge of it. Wow, this, oh, here we go. Uh, 500,000 Americans. <laughs> So even if he was in charge of all of them, there may have been different divisions and stuff like that. Yeah, you got you got to know that that his and military historians are, are probably screaming at us right now um, because they probably have all these <laughs> answers. But you got to know it was either a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, tens of thousands. This isn't a small business. This is five hundred thousand. <laughs> I mean, how many leaders would he have that yeah. he would have conversations with? This is like saying I'm going to go take all of the employees at Walmart. Yes. And I'm going to tell them all to do run against those people <laughs> shooting at them at the same time. And I have 100% confidence we're going to do the an extraordinary thing that's totally impossible for any army to do. And you know what's wild <laughs> about leadership, too, especially with what he was doing? There is a massive risk involved. Yes. You are talking about human life. He knows. Right. He knows there will be negative things that occur with the making of this decision. But the greater outcome, right? will be to the benefit of all at that point. So the willingness to take the risk, even to fight through the pain, through going through that point, they still do it. Yes. And the fact that as a leader, you can go and tell somebody, you're probably going to die. It's not going to work out in your specific favor, but all of us, we're going to make it happen. I like. I also like how quickly he was able to adapt when he recognized the weakness of the Germans or the enemy. Listen, or your, let's say business, your competition. What's the solution? Yes. It's always adaptation. <laughs> yes, yeah, 100%. Yeah. He was defensively adapting to the ebb and flow of the other troops. Right. Anytime what I would say is a break in the phalanx, right, right which is certainly these lines, he's like, that's where we're going to move. Mm-hmm. And he could see it. As in, in war, at these larger accounts, when you have so many bodies at play, you have different pressure points that are occurring. And so as you apply a pressure to a certain area, it has to be countered. Right? Mm, yes. This is just the law of how these things work. So right. in the military aspect, as I apply pressure here, can I then rechannel the resources around to where they have had to move so they have a break, a weakness at a point? Because that's where we're going to go through. Yes, and it is interesting. They, they found some of his journals. And it he, was was really, a, he was a journaler? Yeah, yeah, he was a journaler. But they found some of his journals, and literally hundreds of times in there, on all different types of pages, all different types of days, he would just write, do the unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> this guy was so badass, bro, I'm telling yeah. you. <laughs> well, that's but you, common leadership. You're running yes. your business. Right. It's the same thing day in and day it's, out. It's the same thing. What can you do just like that, totally unexpected, and where people are like, whoa, not only is it refreshing, 
it's going to get them jacked up. All the people that are here are like, wow, that was wild. But I, I kind of want to like end in this statement that I don't want to end. <laughs> I know. Yeah, we I'm can, really we can enjoying go for it. this. <laughs> yeah, same. Um, one of the things that he said, and this is a problem that we face now, and you see this in tech companies because we're on the tech side, but I guarantee you this is in every small business, Dumb. and I've had this problem as a leader. But one of the things he says is no good decision was ever made in a swivel chair. No. <laughs> no. So his whole idea, and then he said, do everything you ask of those you command. He was in the front lines. This yeah. motherfucker was he in knew- a Jeep. B- bombs are hitting him, and he's standing there tall. Yeah. <laughs> How many times have we said, even you and I, with right. Tartle, unless we put our face out there, mm-hmm. I can't expect anyone else to do it. Mm-mm. Unless I'm actually eating the grit with them. Yeah. Why should I expect them to do the same? Right. They have to know that I'm there with them. Yes. If people just see your armchair quarterbacking, right. and you're not actually out there, also, it helps you as a leader because you understand the nuances of business. You understand those individuals that are making that impact. It forces you to go walk the factory floor, which many business owners never did. And I watched it a lot. Well, I mean, it's so funny. They have the show where they do this, and it's like, as a CEO, you shouldn't have to do this. This is the stupidest like, show ever. Undercover show? boss? Just go out there and go walk around. Patton, he would have got the same answers whether he was undercover or whether he was regular. He would have been slapping those bosses in the face. <laughs> because he was so... He was so in the moment of understanding, yeah, you know, I mean, I, there's pictures of him and there's like a tank stuck and he's out there helping them get the tank out. That's, that's and he may help amazing. them for 10 minutes or doesn't whatever. Matter. It doesn't matter. You're there. Yes. Show up. Yes. Do not smoke a cigar. Yeah. <laughs> get the lever. He's holding it, pushing. He's getting Put your muddy. Put your coat and your, your yeah, aviators yeah. <laughs> on and rip the damn tank out of the mud. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. But I mean, and so he earned the respect because you have to have respect to be able to do something like what the major things that he accomplished. Correct. I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable the things that he accomplished. And, and I'll share this. If your company's remote, go fly to your employees. Mm-hmm. Go meet up with them. Surprise them. Yes. And don't tell me you don't have the damn time. You do. Go do it. You, can, you have to meet people where they are. Get out of the fucking chair. Get out of the chair. Yeah, that's I such a great chairs. quote. I think, I, think, I think if there's anything. Can we anything, make a t-shirt? Yeah, we should if it's not um, patent. That would be great. If it's not but patented. I, I want, yeah. <laughs> That's why I did that on purpose. <laughs> Nailed it. But I want people, if they take anything out of this, hopefully they take it that is, you know, and maybe you could put it on a three by five card, put it in your pocket or something, and then or put it next to your computer, mm-hmm. you know, get out of the swivel chair, you know, general patent. Put that on your put that on your screensaver, whatever it is, and start in your business, especially here in Albuquerque. I mean, there's no excuse to, I, I know of a CEO, he takes, because uh, they they have to be at, you know, on site, this isn't a mm-hmm. remote thing, but he takes different employees every day at lunch for a 30 to 45 minute walk, just them and them, and That's they great. talk about, they talk about everything. I love that. So, you know, you can get outside, take somebody for a walk, you take s- one of your leaders for a walk. And you'll know, you'll know where the break in your own command is. You'll know where the weaknesses mm-hmm. are. You'll, okay. It, that stuff. Once you, Patton was on the front line, so he knew that. He was in total communication with all of his, if you want to call them managers or subordinates, whatever, whatever you want to. Yeah. He, he had the pulse. He could feel. And, and you know, to end this, because I know we're kind of going too long on this one, but the big beautiful part about this was he always thought long-term vision. You have to. That was his thought process is like long-term vision. What does this look like? And you out there making small short-term actions with yes. the front lines towards the long-term vision. And his long-term version was to take North Korea when we we're in Korea and we didn't listen to it. We keep pushing through. <laughs> and guess what we have now? <laughs> yeah. Keep pushing. North Korea, thanks for starving out your population. General, yeah, General Patton literally would have he would we would have had just a Korea. Yeah. And as South Korea was, that's they would have all that. No, no. They would have unified, had all that. A Instead we Korea. Did this because we were afraid of the Chinese. Yeah, a unified Korea. A unified Korea. So unify your workforce. Yes. Do the unexpected. Mm -hmm. Get out of the swivel chair and become a leader. Thank you for joining us on the Albuquerque Business Podcast. And thanks to our sponsor, RigbyDigital.com. Make sure to subscribe and share. And go to ABQPodcast.com. Get show notes, resources, and links to everything we talked about today to help you navigate your journey as an entrepreneur and business owner.